I request now our president, uh, Professor Neelan Magarwal, to please welcome the delegates and the guests, the speakers for today. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. So with great pleasure, I welcome you all for this important CME of today, infections and uh, stillbirths. So the special, uh, uh, special speciality about today's webinar is that chairperson, Dr. Sarla, is, I'm happy to tell you, is my teacher too. And she used to teach us a lot about torch infections, when to get it done, when not to get it done. Because all of you must have seen that patient whosoever comes to us, either with some uh, one abortion, two abortions or some other loss, everybody has uh, a slip of a torch test with her. So today's CMA is very important in at least making it a uh, sensitization, uh, sensitizing everybody in the fact that who should get torch done and when it is important and how it is important for our uh, pregnancy outcome. So without wasting much time, I will just request the organizers to uh, start on with the program. I will introduce the committee members first and then I'll hand over the proceedings to the committee chair and Dr. Uh, the committee secretary. Uh, I'm really proud and privileged to have Dr. Poonam Varma Kumar, Professor and Head, MGIMS Sevagram Varda. You all know her very well. She's consented to be the chairperson of our committee, trained at Sweden, Columbia. And she's a great clinical skills trainer, especially emergency obstetric care. Also interested in medical education, trained at JIPMER, core member of many, many important uh, working committees uh, uh, working groups specially related to maternal mortality. PPH, she introduced the bundle approach to India, partography, EMOC, PPTCT, PIEH, stillbirths, most important, and pre arrival birth defects. And she's been associated doing all these uh, through WHO, FIGO, Bill, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, ICMR, Oregon University, and Harvard University, USA. She's also a TAG member for uh, many uh, in Clin, India, and also biomedical research in HIV and ICMR. A resource person and expert for many India, government of India toolkits and national guidelines, and recipient of many awards, many orations, 96 guest lectures, international and international uh, conferences. She has presented her work and 78 articles and eight chapters in international and national journals. The chair of this committee, is, I'm also proud because she's one of my very dear students at a JNMC IT, Dr. Rehana Najam. She's currently heading the Department for OBGY at the Tankar Mahavir Medical College, Muradabad. She's the committee for the, uh, so she's the secretary for the committee. Uh, apart from uh, her MS, she has done a fellowship in ART and in uh, minimal access surgery, and she's an FICOG, and she's various, uh, a member of various bodies. Her area of interest is endoscopy and high-risk pregnancy. Uh, with more than 18 years of experience and more than 31 publications in national and international journals, she's an invited faculty at various conferences and herself a great, uh, has go great administrative leadership qualities, a great a passionate teacher, and she is currently pursuing the FAMO Fellowship and has been awarded uh, best paper at uh, many conferences. Then uh, we have other members of this committee, Dr. Asta Lalwani, she's also from Tirthankar Muradabad. Uh, Dr. Shashi Bala, she is professor and head, Department for OBGY, SRMS Medical College, UP, and also Dr. Asha Rati, she's practicing here, the senior most person of uh, the Aligarh Robson Gaini Society currently, and she's uh, uh, practicing at Rati Hospital Aligarh. So uh, I'll just now stop my share and hand over the, the, uh, the proceedings to, the, uh, to Dr. Poonam. Uh, and before that, I would request Dr. Nuzat to please introduce our uh, esteemed and illustrious chairperson for today. Thank you, Dr. Tamkin. And, uh, and welcome to each one of you who have joined here. What I realized was, you, you know, she's, she's a teacher of teachers and absolutely popular. Everyone was so happy to see you, Dr. Serla, joining. Love that reaction, to tell you the truth. We love that reaction. 
It's, it's absolute. So just to introduce uh, Madam, and, uh, and it's, it's indeed a privilege and an honor to be invited to do so. She's the former head of the unit, PGI Chandigarh, responsible for setting up of the department um, of Opkine in a government hospital, current uh, consultant at, uh, in the department of Opkine Fortis Hospital, Mohali. But what is very important is she's got many, many accolades and uh, more than 50 publications to her credit. What is uh, absolutely, you know, very, very nice was a teacher and guide and mentor to many, many people. And we thank, thank Dr. Sarla for agreeing to be a part of this session. And we invite you, ma'am, to be a chairperson. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So Dr. Poonam, please. So a very good uh, afternoon to all of you, uh, all my teachers, my colleagues, friends. Uh, today we have collected here for something which is very, very important and which probably over the years we have been overlooking. When we talk about this uh, particular topic, which is a stillbirth related to infections, all of us know that many a times we were getting CRP positive, we were treating them and suddenly IUFT will happen. And uh, we, we really didn't know how to explain to the women and how to explain to their relatives. So there were so many issues. This is one topic which we felt that we should really take it over. And thank you so much, Dr. Tamkeen, for giving me and Rihanna this opportunity that we could uh, conduct this workshop. Uh, in this workshop, we have taken it something like this, that we are going to have two guest lectures. Uh, one of them will be given by Dr. Mali. In a minute, I'm going to introduce her to you. She's from UK. The second one is from Lucknow, Dr. Amita Pandey, who is a professor in KGMU. And we are going to have a very interesting quiz uh, which probably would be one of, his, uh, of its kind because it's a sort of P quiz, a composite quiz, where participants, I mean the uh, audience, as well as the uh, quiz responders, both will be uh, together. So without wasting time, we would like to listen to Dr. Malini. So if I have to introduce uh, Dr. Malini, the first thing I would like to say that she is one of the obstetrician and gynecologists who's known for her smile, who's known for her patience, and also known for uh, not being a real gynecologist in the sense that in uh, whatever in and around we are seeing uh, over the years, uh, there's some kind of irritability seen uh, for which we all are famous, but she's a little different one. She's MBBS MD and FRCOG, and she's presently working as consultant to BGYN West Flock Hospital, NHS Foundation Trust in UK. She's a member from RARCOG and she has been uh, uh, in the Race Equality Task Force. Uh, she's been a MRCOG examiner for MRCOG Part 3. She has number of publications in international and national journals. Uh, she has taken medical training initiative, so she was training program director for different attainments. Uh, she was also training program director for the School of Obstetrics and Gynecology. And uh, one of the very interesting thing about her is that uh, she was a volunteer faculty for Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. And many a times when we were developing those skill station models, she was with us. And she's uh, published several posters. Uh, she has several uh, index publications, which are more than 100. She's winner of several awards. Uh, she's been expert of development of several uh, maternal health guidelines for government of India as well. So uh, with all that, uh, uh, I request uh, uh, Dr. Malini to please come over. Dr. Malini, stage is all yours. We would like to hear you. Thank you so much, Poonam. Poonam is a very dear friend of mine, and we did our uh, MDs together at Sevagram. So we go back a very long way. And uh, thank you all so much for inviting me today. Uh, my remit today was to give a bit of a perspective about infections and their relationship to stillbirths. 
Is it a casual relationship? Is it a causal relationship? In spite of advancing so much in medicine, this question sometimes appears to be still lurking in the corner and we don't really know. Just to give you a little bit more about me, uh, my roots, I always say, is in India. I did my medicine from uh, Sevagram. I love coming back. With COVID, I couldn't for the last couple of years, but I love coming back and I keep doing that ever so often. And uh, my heart is here. And my branches have, are in the UK with home here. I live in a little town called Berries and Edmonds where the Magna Carta was signed many centuries ago. West Suffolk Hospital is a district general hospital where I work within the NHS system. And uh, my karma bhumi is here as it were, as also with the deanery, which where we do our postgraduate training. And uh, West Suffolk Hospital has about 2,500 deliveries, which might appear to be very small going by Indian standards. But when I was working in South Zajan, it was something like 15,000, 16,000 deliveries. But yes, the patient expectations, everything else, varies in different parts of the world. But the bottom line is the patients are the same. What afflicts them is the same. The humanity does not change. So talking about stillbirth, I know I'm the first speaker for today. So I just thought I'll set the ground definitions as it were. So any baby, this is a WHO one, who dies after 28 weeks of pregnancy is classified as a stillbirth. And what we don't want is little bundles like this. And uh, so that's where we are at this point in time. What we know is that every 16 seconds, there is a stillbirth in the world. And that is a very stark and startling and hurtful statistic. So if you were to go a little more into the UN data, I'm sure you're all very familiar with it. I was doing a little more reading up about it. So 84% of all the stillbirths are in the lower and low income countries, which account for 62% of all the live births. So you can see the disparity already coming in there and about 2 million a year of the babies that could have been alive, a vast proportion of them if you were able to prevent it. So it gives us food for thought, and it's good that we've got a setup that's coming up, a committee coming up to uh, address it. So yes, we do have the medical factors, but what has always interested me is the other factors that are associated with an increased uh, in stillbirth numbers. You've got the disparity between low income and high income countries. UK something like 131 deliveries, whereas India, something like one in 58. Socioeconomic status, where, which is worldwide. It's not just in, a, in whichever part, whichever community you take, the lower socioeconomic status, you'll always find health inequities, whether it's stillbirth, maternal birth deaths, whether it is uh, you know, cancer diagnosis, whatever it may be. Rural versus urban, we see the difference. There was a paper in Nepal about the number of uh, stillbirths are much higher in the rural areas, which recently came out, especially during COVID times. Ethnicity. Ethnicity is something that is very interesting. Uh, one of the bits that uh, Poonam was talking about was my role with differential attainment, where differential attainment is really the disparity in career progression or in educational achievements amongst people from different ethnic backgrounds. And there's a lot of work going on at this point in time. The health inequities among different races was uh, highlighted during the COVID epidemic. A lot of you might have read, or it was in the news, that people from what we call the Black Asian minority ethnic communities in the UK had higher incidences of COVID deaths that people could not actually put a finger on. It wasn't socioeconomic because many of them are professionals, but there's a high number of deaths compared to the white population. And that we see even among, there's a group called five times more, but the recent research has shown, recent data is four times more evidence of maternal mortality among the uh, black and ethnic minority groups within the UK. And also two to three times increase in stillbirth. The RCOG will be uh, releasing a paper 
on research on Monday. That's the latest data we have there. So there is a trend and there is a variance in health in, and there's, there are health inequities. So if you look at the global burden of stillbirths, as I said, one in 58 in India, one in 321 in the UK. And again, within the income groups, you can see there is a disparity. Why would that be? The most common causes of stillbirths are intrapartum complications in this part of the world, hypoxia, antipartum hemorrhage, and maternal health, 10% of them are because of diabetes, hypertension, obesity, lifestyle, sedentary lifestyle, smoking, alcohol, and maternal or infections in general. So the remit for today is to focus on infections, which is what we will be doing. It's one of the top five causes. In the low and lower socioeconomic uh, income countries, eight to 50% of stillbirths are attributed to infections. In Sub-Saharan Africa, 20% are due to malaria and 1% due to syphilis. In a greater part of the world, you'll find that syphilis has been controlled, though it is coming up, even in, we are finding a few more cases in this part of the world too. Then coming back to my original question, are infections a casual or a causal association with stillbirths? For many reasons, the relation between infection and stillbirth is often unclear. More importantly, infection is seldom apparent from the case history or when you examine the patient or the mother of the fetus or the fetus. Even histological examinations of the placenta, placental cultures, fetal autopsies could miss important infections. Additionally, even with evidence of infection, the precise reasons for specific stillbirths are still not known. It's difficult to establish it. Neither positive serological tests nor organisms in the placenta or the fetus prove causality. Looking further, infection can initiate a change of events leading to stillbirth and its contribution to fetal death may not be appreciated. Like for example, rubella infections may not directly cause stillbirth, but cause congenital uh, anomalies which cause stillbirth. Which stillbirths are attributed to infection depends partly on the extent of the investigation and the classification system used. And that varies between different countries and different places. In countries where you got, you know, low, so a low income, in low income countries, placental histological examination, placental cultures, fetal autopsies are usually unavailable. In high income countries, these tests are available, but are not done routinely. Since confirmation of the infectious etiology of stillbirth requires use of these techniques as a minimum, it is believed that the contribution of infections in stillbirth is substantially underdiagnosed in all the settings, whether it's low income, lower income, high income, whichever country you look at. And if routine bacterial and viral cultures are supplanted by advanced molecular techniques, we may be able to find more answers. But that's where we are today. How do infections cause stillbirths? They're different uh, mechanisms. Maternal infection may lead to systemic illnesses with the mother becoming severely ill, like for example, influenza, and the fetus may die because of high temperatures, respiratory distress, or other systemic reactions without the organisms transferring themselves to the placenta or fetus. Alternatively, the, the placenta might get infected directly resulting in reduced blood flow to the uterus, like for example, malarial infections, or the fetus might be directly infected with damage to vital organ, or they, if the infection occurs earlier on in pregnancy, the fetus may not die immediately, but develop a congenital anomaly, which could lead to fetal death at a later stage of pregnancy, like the torch infections. And lastly, a maternal infection, what we call uh, ascending infection, can lead to, you know, uh, as we know, it causes destabilization of the membranes, leading to premature rupture of membranes, prematurity, 
and uh, that causing that causing the death in the baby or or a stillbirth there. So there are different then paucity of healthcare, social factors. We will talk about that a bit later. We can see this is just a busy slide. Don't worry too much about it. But we can see there are a lot of vector-borne infections and the different organisms and the reservoirs, which could be which are the cause of stillbirth in different parts of the world. So if you look at bacterial infections, there are more than 130 different bacteria which might precipitate intrauterine infections, and many of them have been associated with stillbirth. The types of organisms and the mechanisms by which they cause death are similar across geographical areas. However, the proportion of pregnancies affected by bacterial infection are much higher in countries of low and middle income rather than higher income. And the bacterial infections that lead to stillbirth can be divided into those that reach the fetal compartment through the placenta and those that ascend through the vagina and the cervix. In the transplacental infections, uh, they can, like syphilis, the placenta, placental villi often show evidence of infection. And since the organisms enter the fetus through the umbilical vein, the liver is the most commonly affected organ. Like H. influenzae, pseudomonas, there are other inf bacterial infections that are associated with stillbirth. Listeria, we all know, can cause microabscesses of the placenta. Tuberculosis can cause stillbirth either due to placental infection, which is not as common, but I'm sure you all can tell me more about it or maternal cachexia. Ascending vaginal, group B streptococcus, E. coli, Klebsiella, all of them can do it. And it often it show, shows up as fetal pneumonitis on autopsy as the baby inhales infected amniotic fluid, preterm labor and prematurity. And this is preventable with screening and treatment. Viral infections, HIV as the CD4 count falls, Rubella, mumps, measles, chickenpox. Chickenpox we can talk about because maternal ill health or fetal infection. Influenza we've spoken out about before. Power virus is something we see more in this part of the world, which causes fetal anemia, high drops and death. Vaccinations are being developed and vaccinations tend to decrease the incidence of viral infection associated stillbirths. Protozoal, malaria, especially Plasmodium falciparum. And uh, it is interesting, reading up for this talk, primary gravidas previously unexposed have the worst outcomes with maternal death, preterm labor, and stillbirth. Toxoplasmosis, I knew you were referring to torch. I'm sure we'll be talking about it down the line. Prevention is possible with chemoprophylaxis, bed nets, and I'm sure you all know more about it. I just thought we need to talk a little bit about COVID. All of us have gone through these last two years. It has been a tsunami for healthcare. So there's a lot of data coming through. It's early days yet. There will be more coming through in the years to come. And the relationship between COVID-19 infection and stillbirth. We do not know whether there's a direct causality because of the actual infection and the virus. But decrease in access to healthcare, lack of hospitals, lack of difficulty. I understand in India, you had to get a COVID negative certificate before you could go to hospital for birth. And it, there was difficulty in getting that. Disruption in the ch supply chain of medicines, equipment, human resources, and a lot of indirect associations, lack of family planning resources, contraception, safe abortion services, leading to progression of pregnancies, which may otherwise have been terminated or not happened at all. And these unplanned pregnancies increasing the stillbirth rate. Severe maternal illnesses. We have seen in the UK that pregnant women with COVID infection have done quite badly. They have had a very high incidence of ITU admissions, needing ECMO and other support uh, facilities. The, in, the recent data is showing that the, there's a risk of the stillbirth is two times in, in COVID infections. Prematurity, 
sometimes iatrogenic because we used to go ahead with the delivery of the baby to be able to manage the mother better. Maternal anemia and malnutrition leading to uh, stillbirths in the baby. So it's a bit of more of an indirect association as far as we know for now, rather than a direct association between the viral infection with COVID-19 and stillbirths. But there definitely has been a jump in stillbirths during the COVID pandemic. And we think it's more the associated factors. What can be done? Increasing awareness amongst patients to access healthcare earlier. Healthcare providers and early intervention will go a long way in preventing the stillbirths. What we do know across the world, it's not just in low income countries, across the world, data collection is not very good, it's not very robust. So better data collection, especially among the target population. Health policies need to reflect this and there should be more money pumped into preventing these stillbirths. Research into vaccines, research into prophylactic medications would be very important. And I'm sure uh, you're Laura, all aware of the sepsisics that we have. We have a, a big campaign in the UK about sepsisics which is infections uh, across the board, not just mothers, but especially among pregnant women. Give three oxygen fluid challenge antibiotics, take three cultures, measure lactates and the urine output. And especially with pregnancy, considering thromboprophylaxis and assist the fetal state and consider delivery. So that would go a long way in decreasing maternal deaths and stillbirths among infection and sepsis. When I was again uh, looking at the uh, reading up for this uh, presentation to prepare the presentation, there was this little lady from uh, Kalahandi in Odisha uh, who had recently lost a baby during the COVID pandemic due to lack of healthcare because she was not able to uh, reach the hospital in time. She's grieving for a little baby. We want less of this and lots more of this and any initiative towards the transition would be a step in the right direction. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mali. That was indeed a wonderful presentation, I would say, with a lot of statistics to know that it's not only India, but different part of the world uh, we are having all this. Dr. Tamki, your comment, please. Thank you so much. Uh, do we uh, uh, take the question answers? Can we just do it at the end? Yeah. And uh, we'll do it uh, at the uh, end. Just your comment uh, because she was our uh, guest. Uh, okay. Thank speaker. you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Malni, for agreeing to be here with us. It was uh, such an honor for us to have you. And uh, I, I wish you will be able to stay back uh, for the next uh, and the quiz part if you have. <laughs> Thank I you. might stay back for a little bit, but go just before the quiz. Oh, that's all right. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mani. Um, I welcome Dr. Amita. She's a professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, King George Medical University, Lucknow. She has done her uh, uh, international fellowship in cancer uh, from Philadelphia, USA. She's a visiting professor from Vale Cornell Medical Center, New York. She has more than 100 indexed publications, both in international and national journals to her credit. She's the winner of several awards and is involved in various research projects. She is expert in the development of several maternal health guidelines for government of India and is the past secretary of Lucknow chapter of ISOPAP 2019 to 2021, joint secretary of Indian Fertility Society, UP chapter, from 2020 to 2022. Welcome, Dr. Amita. Over to you. Very good afternoon, friends. So uh, at the outset, initially, I would like to uh, say thank you to Professor Tamkeen, Professor Poonam Shivkumar, and the entire team for giving me this wonderful opportunity to interact with all of you. It is indeed a pleasure to be here on this platform where I can see uh, many long lost friends also. So thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity. 
we've just had a wonderful talk by dr malini and she has discussed almost all aspects of still births due to maternal and fetal infections now uh, today i have been assigned the task of talking about preventive strategies guidelines and advocacy for prevention of stillbirth due to maternal and fetal infections now i would just we have already seen how uh, this stillbirth has been a very neglected tra tragedy contributing to a large global burden of stillbirths and dr malini has already shown us that uh, how 77% of the stillbirths majority of the stillbirths occur in south uh, sub saharan africa and south asia we have also seen how when we talk of the rates the stillbirth rates are very high in india we can also we can also when we talk of absolute numbers we convert these rates into numbers we can see how india as far as the absolute numbers are concerned is unfortunately leading the world as far as stillbirths are concerned uh, we have seen in dr malini's presentation how stillbirth is still a big problem as far as the developing countries are concerned so we have seen that um, stillbirths are a neglected tragedy we've also seen how uh, stillbirths are still such an important cause of um, perinatal mortality in developing countries we have seen how india contributes to at least has around 12 to 20 stillbirths per 1000 total births and we have also seen that how when we convert these rates into numbers india unfortunately is the leading uh, co um, contributor to stillbirth the world over unfortunately why we are worried about the stillbirth rate is that it is the key indicator for quality care but as dr malini has already said finding a cause of this stillbirth is actually a challenge she has also told us how infection per se is one of the top 5 causes of stillbirth in low and middle income countries and how we can uh, this uh, infection can contribute to stillbirths and she has also discussed so wonderfully how it is actually a challenge to find out whether the stillbirth has been caused by a maternal or fe fetal infection and how we can go a step further to prove that infection was actually the cause of the stillbirth now i have been told to talk about the preventive strategies for stillbirths because of infections so again i would like to reinforce what dr malini has said that a large number of bacterial viral spirochetal protozoal fungal infections cause stillbirth there is a whole long list and we need to keep this list in mind because when we are talking about preventive strategies we should know what we have to prevent what we have to screen and what we have to diagnose and what we have to treat so we have for that reason we have to keep all this long list in our mind whenever we are addressing patients with stillbirth or whenever we are thinking of strategies to prevent stillbirth the inf uh, infectious uh, the infections leading to stillbirths now uh, as far as the prevention is concerned whenever we talk of prevention the first thing is spreading awareness about the fact that infection can also lead to stillbirth this is very relevant in the scenario in which we work in india we all you all would agree with me that a majority of the women especially women from the rural background and women from the urban background who are not so literate are not even aware that 
some infection which may, they may think is a small infection may contribute to something as serious as stillbirth. So it is very, very important to counsel mothers to contact caregiver immediately in case she has any fever or fever with rash or she has lower urinary tract symptoms or she has vaginitis or she has preterm premature rupture of membrane or she has preterm labor because these are very common manifestations of infection in mother and all mothers, all pregnant women have to be counseled to immediately contact the caregiver in case she has any of these symptoms so that she can undergo appropriate testing and treatment. And then First and foremost, we have to remember that we have to educate patient about avoiding infectious agent and that they can do by practicing good hygiene practices. So it is better if in our hospitals, we put up IEC materials regarding these important education uh, points. Secondly, hand washing is a must. All these women must be counseled about routine, regular hand washing before eating, after eating, before touching anything, whenever they go out, whenever they return to the home from uh, anywhere outside. Various food-based precautions are very important for educating uh, education of these patients. They have to be told that they should avoid unpasteurized milk, they should avoid undercooked meat, tinned juices, raw fruits, vegetables without washing should be avoided. Thanks to this COVID, wearing a mask has now become a norm. So this should be advocated again and again that proper hand washing, regular hand washing and putting on a mask and personal protection is very, very important if they want to prevent themselves, protect themselves from infectious agents. Then for pregnant women, it is always better to counsel them to avoid travel to high risk locations, like uh, which is very, very important in case of uh, spread of malaria, yellow fever, and even Zika virus, which uh, till date we thought that it is far away from us, but now we all know that it is very much there in India also. Then we have to count, educate patient to avoid contact with rodents, cat litter, and practice precautions about handling pets and lab animals. Now, um, we also have to educate them to avoid certain infections in pregnancy, like sexually transmitted infection. We have to counsel them regarding the use of condoms, avoiding recreational drugs like HIV, HCV, hepatitis B, which can contribute to severe maternal illness, which in turn can lead to stillbirths. Then uh, various insect borne diseases are very common, very prevalent in India like malaria, dengue, Zika virus. So we have to keep educating our women to ensure that they wear protective clothing, avoid outdoors at dawn and dusk, which is a very common time when these insects are uh, there. And then uh, using mosquito nets, repellents. Then one very important point which has already been addressed by Dr. Malini is vaccination before pregnancy. It is very important that patients must be educated to ensure that they are fully vaccinated against rubella, chickenpox, hepatitis B. Now COVID-19 is also in that list and influenza before pregnancy so that these infections are taken care of. Now, besides this, a meticulous antenatal screening and care is also advocated to prevent stillbirths because of infections. In this, routine screening of all pregnant women for syphilis is a must. We have Dr. Poonam with us and we uh, it is actually uh, a proud moment for all of us that uh, Dr. Poonam has actually been instrumental thinking about the Ministry of Health and National Guidelines for diagnosis and management of syphilis in pregnancy. Similarly, we, if in case the patient is symptomatic, we should remember to screen her for sexually transmitted diseases like chlamydia and gonorrhea. Then screening for group B streptococcal infection and treating if the, uh, the woman, if she is posit positive with antibiotics and labor is 
uh, should be practiced. Then all women coming with preterm premature rupture of membranes must be given antibiotic treatment. They must be given lactobacillus pessaries to reduce the risk of chorioamnionitis. It is better if women themselves have taken routine immunizations for childhood illnesses and they also have immunized their children against measles, mums, rubella, and varicella, because these are few very important viral uh, few infections that contribute significantly to stillbirth. Then timely immunization of pregnant women against influenza and COVID would also be a very wise move if we want to prevent the mother and the fetus from these infections. Then as uh, reducing exposure to cat litter to reduce toxoplasmosis and reducing exposure to soft cheese to reduce uh, listeriosis are another important uh, care that may be offered to um, uh, pregnant women. Now, besides a proper history, it is very important that a thorough evaluation of all cases of stillbirth must be done to rule out infection as a cause of stillbirth. See, it is so important to find a cause, assign a cause to the stillbirth because that would help us improve. That would start that cycle of prevention of a similar catastrophe in the subsequent pregnancy. So whenever there is a stillbirth, if we have to rule out infection, besides the routine prenatal laboratory test, testing for syphilis, testing the mother for HIV, hepatitis B, rubella, chlamydia, gonorrhea is uh, there in the guidelines. Then uh, initially only we were talking a lot about torch infections. Even though testing all mothers who've had a stillbirth for torch titers is not advocated, but yes, there are recommendations for taking up tests for toxoplasmosis. Serology for parvovirus is there in the guidelines for all mothers who have had a stillbirth. Then maternal blood culture for listeria. There are a uh, few guidelines which suggest that maternal cervical and vaginal cultures may be done in women who've had a stillbirth to rule out infection. But there are again other guidelines which have negated this. Then a proper thorough placental histologic examination is recommended in cases of stillbirth. There are also few guidelines that have suggested that one must take a subamniotic culture. That is, you move the swab in between the amnion and the chorion. You take subamniotic cultures and send them for culture. Then uh, if fetal autopsy is being done, then specific bacterial viral cultures are recommended and PCR-based diagnosis of these infections are recommended. Similarly, culture of fetal heart blood or fluid from uncontaminated fetal so sites are recommended during autopsy in cases of stillbirth. Then after these uh, strategies, we come to the guidelines. There are innumerable number of guidelines for prevention of maternal infection. Uh, two very important guidelines in this context are the WHO guidelines for prevention and treatment of maternal infections. And one very other, uh, another very useful site is the Geneva Foundation for Medical Education and Research site, where almost all the infections that we have just listed, and Dr. Malini has also talked about them, all those bacterial, viral, fungal, protozoal, spiroketal infections are there. All you need to do is to click on those uh, infection, and you will get an entire, um, uh, all the methods by which that infection can be diagnosed and all the treatment modalities for that infection. Then as far as the ACOG guidelines are concerned, in March 2020, we have a refined ACOG guidelines, which recommends that infection being a very important cause of stillbirth must be excluded and must be aggressively addressed and treated. Similarly, the Green Top guidelines also have listed a large number of 
investigations and treatments in women who come with fever, in symptomatic women with um, flu-like symptoms where you can go for blood cultures and midstream urine culture, vaginal swabs, cervical swabs, viral screens, testing for syphilis, testing for other tropical infections. If we need to prevent and protect the mother from these infections and from these infections contributing to stillbirth. Finally, we come to the advocacy. Here, I would like to, to quote two very important papers. There was a big systematic review in published in BMC Pregnancy and Childbirth in the year 2009. And then there was another one published in Clinical Obstetric and Gynecology in 20, 2010, which actually um, spurred the entire international community into thinking that it's actually high time that we have to make every baby count. Because till then, we were just hearing about having every mother count. So here they planned that they, sh they must um, take account of these stillbirths, these preventable deaths by approaching it in a manner similar to maternal death surveillance and response and prepare tools for um, and guidelines for identification of cases and co collection of data. And it was then that WHO came up with the making every baby count guideline in 2016. And this was followed by another systematic review of globally reported cases of stillbirth. And finally, in July 2020, we had the newborn, um, the every newborn action plan and the goal of which was beside preventing newborn deaths to end preventable stillbirths to less than 12 per thousand total births by 2020, 2030. And besides there are now other strategies also which has, have come up as we have the sepsis bundle, the PPH bundle, there is the safer baby bundle also. Then there is a global strategy for women's, children's and adolescent health where stillbirth has been addressed and it is, it is now being recommended that we have to take the stillbirth very seriously. Now, if, if we talk about advocacy in India, our India, India has come up with the India Newborn Action Plan way back in 2014 to end preventable stillbirths to achieve single digit stillbirth rate by 2030. And then in 2016, they had also come up with the Sentinel Stillbirth Surveillance System. Again, here I would like to congratulate Dr. Poonam that it is a wonderfully prepared document which has been made to address the unmet need of stillbirth assessment in our country. The unfortunate part is a large part of India is, is still, uh, has still not uh, actually um, adopted this um, surveillance system for stillbirth. It is high time that we start assessing each stillbirth so that we can know what are the causes of these stillbirths. Then despite all these strategies, and, uh, Lancet took out a Lancet series in 2019 where they initially showed that from 2000 to 2009, there was a steady decline in the rates of stillbirths. But unfortunately, during the COVID pandemic, the stillbirth rates again shot up for reasons best known to all of us. So now WHO has again geared up to prevent infections to, uh, for babies' protection. They are advocating this. They are also advocating the, dangerous, uh, the prevention strategies for dangerous maternal infections and how it is very important for all of us to talk, test, and treat these infections. So, as a take home message, even though I had to talk mainly about infection, I would just like to emphasize that stillbirth is actually a very devastating complication of pregnancy. And the fact that we are still having persistent high rates of stillbirth highlights the need and the importance of conducting these audits so that we can know where the stillbirths are high, what are the causes of this, these stillbirths, so that we can apply appropriate preventive 
measures to address the, them aggressively. Infection, we all know, is one of the most treatable causes of stillbirths, and hence that at least needs to be addressed very aggressively, and an integrated programmatic approach is needed to avoid stillbirth. And finally, I would like to end with this small poem that I found on the net. An angel from the book of life wrote down my baby's birth. Then she closed the book and whispered, too beautiful for earth. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. And if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Thank you so much, Dr. Amita. It was indeed an excellent talk and very nicely you have explained all the preventive approaches and how we can uh, prevent the stillbirth uh, in, in even Indian programs, how the surveillance of each and every stillbirth should be done. So thank you so much. Um, uh, Dr. Poonam, uh, should we take yeah. the question answers? Uh, uh, quiz? Yeah, I mean, uh, let us do it after quiz or should we do it now uh, for the uh, two guest speakers and then we go on to quiz. We can have just five minutes. We, ha we are not late. So we can have five minutes for the question answers. So we request the audience and everybody, whoever has questions and either put it on the chat box or please raise your hands and we will invite you for the question. Uh, indeed, it was such a wonderful talk by both the guest speakers uh, uh, where, uh, you know, Dr. Mali had covered most of the global as well as national uh, scenarios and what is happening and what are we supposed to do. And Dr. Amita wonderfully spoke about what are various strategies globally as well as in India, which is being taken up to reduce these uh, stillbirths. So anybody who has any question, Dr. Rehana, please uh, carry over. Okay, ma'am. Uh, we have um, an interesting quiz on stillbirth and infections. And uh, Dr. Poonam Shivkumar, uh, along with me, is the quiz master. And we have interesting um, um, uh, questions. And there are responders as well as participants who will be responding to the questions today. So first of all, I, uh, I would like to introduce the responders and then I will request Dr. Poonam to tell us the rules of the quiz. So we have Dr. Shabana Sultan. She is a professor in Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology from uh, GMC Bhopal. She had uh, many, uh, interna many na national papers in uh, various national con conferences. She has published papers in both national and international journals. And she is the member of uh, esteemed team, team of PPH bundle along uh, with the Sevagram. And she's the past joint secretary of Bhopal Ops and Gaini Society. At present, she is treasurer Bhopal Ops and Gaini Society. Then we have Dr. Anuja Vivek Bhale Rao. She is professor exactly. and head uh, of the uh, Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, NKB Salve Institute of Medical Sciences, Nagpur. She is having more than 30 years of teaching experience. She is having uh, more than 52 publications, both in national and international journals to her credit. And she is invited faculty to various national and international conferences. She has also received many awards, uh, including the best video award at AGL and various other conferences. And she had been a national cricket player also. Uh, then we have next responder, Dr. Preeti Priya Darshini. She is assistant professor at uh, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Gorakhpur. She is having many publications, both in national and international journal, master trainer for PPH emergency care, using a bundle approach in India, as well as in other countries also. She is the master trainer for integrated maternal, infant, and young child nutrition and quality improvement. Uh, in association with Alive and Thrive uh, um, approach. And then we have the Dr. Archana Kumari. She is Associate Professor at RIMS Ranchi. She is Secretary to ISOPAP Ranchi Chapter 2022, Executive Member of ISOPAP 2019. She is the Founder Secretary of Indian Fertility Society, Jharkhand Chapter, E-Zone Coordinator and Quiz Committee, uh, is zone coordinator for quiz committee foxy convener of clinical research committee from 2019 to 2021 
vice president to Rachi Ops Kaini Society in year 2015 to 2019. She is invited faculty in various national and international conferences, presented paper in FIGO in 2018 conference in Rio, Brazil, has publications in national and international journals, and recipient of best free paper award at E-Zone U of Oxy 2007 at Kalyani. Then we have Dr. Alok Sharma. He's consultant of St. Gaini Maternal and Child Health Center, Civil Hospital, Mandi, Himachal Pradesh. He's ex-assistant professor at Dr. Rajendra Prasad, Government Medical College, Kangra at Tanda, Himachal Pradesh. Founder Secretary of Indian Menopause Society, Shimla Chapter, Founder Secretary of Indian Fertility Society, Himachal Pradesh. North Zone Coordinator of Hello Tomorrow CMEs, Advisor to Sexual Medicine Committee, Foxy, Member of Public Awareness Committee, Foxy, Member of Adolescent Health Committee, Foxy. Welcome you all. And now I request Dr. Poonam Shivkumar, Madam, to please tell us the rules of the quiz. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, a very good evening to all of you. Uh, I welcome uh, all of my uh, responders for this particular quiz. Uh, there are certain things we would like to talk about this quiz is that apart from me and Rihanna, nobody knows the questions. So it's truly a quiz for my all the responders and also a quiz for the uh, participants who are here. So uh, this is called a composite quiz where we would be uh, putting up the question and we who have whichever responder, uh, uh, you know, raises the hand first will be the one to answer and others in case they want to add something they would be add so it's an amalgamation of panel as well as quiz but questions are very very interesting in the sense that there are several message uh, messages which we want to give to our participants as well as uh, uh, the responses <clears throat> so let's begin with the first question rehana yes madam so the question number one to all my quiz responders is, does TOR infections cause stillbirth? If they do, does AIGG, high titus, need any treatment? Uh, and well, we, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, this is so Dr. Dr. Anuja is the one, yeah. Yes, Dr. Uh, Anuja. At the outset, I'm extremely thankful for making me a part of this uh, very interesting stillbirth uh, webinar. And uh, as far as we all know that torch consists of toxoplasmosis, O consists of parvovirus, rubella, cytomegalovirus, and herpes. The infections of the torch infections during pregnancy, we all know would lead to not only miscarriages, but stillbirths, preterm labor, and even intrauterine deaths. The most important investigative approach is to get IgG and IgM done. Now, what are these IgG and IgM titers? Now, whenever we uh, have a recent infection, we usually get IgM titers positive. But when we have an IgG titer positive, that implies that the patient has had an infection before. If IgG and IgM are negative, no infection. If IgG is positive, that tells you that there has been a past infection and the patient is immunized, especially in patients with rubella. If IgG is positive, that tells you that the patient is immunized. But if IgM is positive, then it is a recent infection and one needs to treat it. The various modalities for treatment of torch are different. If we talk about toxoplasma, you have uh, the various drugs, as far as antivirals are concerned, for the cytomegalovirus, for the herpes virus, we can continue with the treatment. So a rising high titers, it implies or it requires treatment. And at times, one has to repeat the IgG titers after two months so that we get to know whether they are increasing, whether they are the same, whether they are showing a decreasing trend. So, Rehana, would you like to comment? Uh, I think uh, Dr. Anuja has covered everything. Yes. Uh, yes. You have anything else to add on to it? Yes, in the index pregnancy, especially, I would like to point out that if IgG is positive and IgM is 
like negative we want to know and it is say five months of pregnancy then we should rule out ki it might be like uh, she had uh, this thing positive early in the uh, first trimester and we must proceed with the uh, avdt testing okay and if it is uh, like uh, if there is uh, the avdt test is low it means that she has an infection in the within 3 months so that is important and uh, that uh, fetus carries a risk so yes. it is important from that point of view yeah addition of avdt is a must yeah yeah thank you so much i think it's very clear to everybody that if it is igm positive for sure it needs treatment if it is igg positive Uh, we have to see which gestation it is on and the repeated titers may be done and specifically when it is on fifth month sixth month ensure that you repeat it and you also do igm to see that uh, infection is further there or it is not there so is it clear to everybody any participant has anything to say actually i just would like to add that when we talk about avidity Uh, let's be very clear about what avidity means is the affinity so uh, if there is uh, this, this avidity testing of igg is a must whenever we have igg positive titers so that we can decide on whether we need to put the patient on treatment or uh, even follow up of these patients very well, that's very right and thank you doctor wants to say something yes. she has raised her hand yes sure Dr. Sarla wants to add something. I think. Yes, ma'am. Please, ma'am. Ma'am, please unmute. Is it okay? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Torch has number of infections, and now torch is called S torch, which includes syphilis also. Syphilis. But we are. talking now at this moment of toxoplasma only yeah so we should be particularly for particular infection that what we want to test are we going to test for torch are we going to test for syphilis are we going to test for rubella it doesn't mean that we are wanting one infection and we are testing all first let's stick to torch if one has is suspecting torch how do you suspect torch you should test patients only where you are suspecting if patient had a still birth and you want to know the cause of still birth yes it may help you that patient had infection or not if she was negative both igg negative but whom to test for toxoplasma is when patient has some evidence of infection or the fetus has some evidence of either infection or soft marker whether in the brain whether in the heart some soft marker which is suggested that she may have torch infection so we test that patient for torch so for testing the patient are we testing the mother or are we testing the fetus first start with the mother with the mother we do igg and igm because igm antibody sometimes last for a longer time they may stay in circulation sometimes for year in low level so finding only igm le low level doesn't mean that she has acute infection and she needs to be treated finding both igg and igm we are in a dilemma what to do now two things one is do avdt test and we, we will come to know second is within four weeks do a repeat test take a repeat sample and that paired sample will be tested simultaneously and if that paired sample shows fourfold rise in igg that means this patient had infection now if patient has infection does the fetus has infection because treating mother are we treating mother alone or are we treating fetus if we treat mother alone what we are gaining if we treat fetus what we are gaining we are more concerned at this moment for the fetus because the maternal implication of this infection are very mild 
mother doesn't have many symptoms. She doesn't have anything for which she needs treatment, but she needs this treatment for fetus. Now, what treatment mother needs it? If it is people who really want to treat fetuses, that we must prove infection in the fetus. And proving that infection, we should take amniotic fluid, test it for toxoplasma PCR or toxoplasma culture. If one takes I cord blood, then test the cord blood for toxoplasma or PCR. If fetus is positive, we are doing more service by treating than by treating only mother alone than uh, when fetus is uh, not affected. If fetus is not affected, Mother only needs simple treatment with spiramycin. How long, how much will not be of great concern, but long-term sequelae, it may decrease. So we have to treat fetus. And for treating fetus, the drugs are different. It is pyrimethamine and sulfadizing. For treating the mother, it is spiramycin. So if we treat fetus, only then we, we may be able to decrease decrease the stillbirth rate, but that does not mean we have eliminated the stillbirth rate. Because even if we drug, give this drug in full dosage to the fetus, to the mother, which goes to the fetus, it still has long-term sequelae in the form of chorioretinitis, neurodevelopment problems. So the fetus still uh, after delivery as a neonate may need treatment neonate will need follow up. So treatment of toxoplasma is not very simple. We should not drug every mother with spiramycin just because mother is positive IgG and IgM fourfold, right? We must document fetal infection and then treat the fetus by giving different drugs, which is spiramethacin. And then we say we have achieved something because our main problem is with the fetus and treating every mother just to prevent this will not be of great help. So in countries like France, where this infection is very common, it is, it is very important to treat the fetus. Every maternal infection does not mean fetus is affected. Thank so you this so is much, very- Thank you so much, ma'am. That was indeed a very, very, very important point what you have said. And- uh, we would all look into it that it's not necessary that we keep uh, uh, giving the drug to the mother, but uh, we in, in the uh, upcoming fetal medicine, we should do these tests and ensure that uh, the women gets the right care. Thank you so much. Dr. Rihanna, next question, please. Yes, ma'am. So what leads to fetal death in chorioamnionitis? Uh, yes, Dr. Alo. Ma'am, uh, now, uh, yeah, yeah. ma'am. Now uh, we are discussing again uh, fetal death or stillbirth due to infections. So if we see the uh, due to chorioamnitis, we have got uh, like three me mechanism. If we see, we have got three mechanisms. Like if it 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 could be direct infection, that is, uh, infection reaches the fetus via placenta, and is uh, uh, is like is destroying any of the organs, like any of the important organs, like could be lungs could be heart. So it could be a direct infection. Then there could be a placental damage uh, that could lead to decreased blood flow. So that can also lead to uh, fetal death or uh, stillbirth. Then uh, if it is a severe maternal illness leading to like a high fever or uh, it could be a poor oxygenation uh, again to the fetus or systemic reaction to the illnesses can lead to stillbirth. And in the last, we can see if it can precipitate the preterm labor. So the illness is precipitating the preterm labor and, and the further preterm labor is again uh, causing stillbirth as the fetus is unable to bear the uh, brunt of labor. And again, it could be a high uh, like rate of uh, infections. And further, the, again, this, this all these all mechanisms, as I told you, can again lead to uh, fetal death in uh, chorion and menitis and uh, the manifestations it could be funitis there could be respiratory distress syndrome there could be um, bronchopulmonary dysplasia or uh, there could be a, like white matter disease and thus leading to uh, sometimes uh, cerebral palsy or some retinopathy of uh, prematurity could be there 
or then if it is like uh, some uh, transient uh, hypothyroxinemia of prematurity necrotizing enterocolitis so so many things uh, could be there due to these all things so the uh, three things as i told you and the manifestations also i told you uh, that how the fetal death is going to uh, affect in chorioamnonitis ma'am thank you so much uh, dr rehana i think he has covered most yes, of sir. it and we all know that high fever itself is responsible for the fetal death and that yes, is why they say that it's not important what infection she has but if she has high fever all the baby cytochrome enzymes are stop working and suddenly baby dies it's very important to bring the fever down anything down. else rehana you would like to add no ma'am it's uh, very well explained thank you so much ma'am uh, uh, dr sarla dr tamkin and anyone else want to add something yes for uh, you amnesia can can i yes yes ma'am ma yes, ma It's a you and me night. It's our pleasure that you are with us. Please do. Corio amnionitis means that corion and amnion membranes are infected. Infected. Now it all depends by which organism they are affected. Now, if if these membranes are infected are affected by malaria, hello. Yes, ma'am. We are listening. we are listening if they are affected by malaria the fetal death the malaria will cause the placenta in such a way it cause the blockage of uh, uh, vessels in such a way that fetal death will occur because of the blood supply to the fetus is not reaching now if maternal infection is as the cause of uh, chorioamnonitis many a times maternal infection may not give rise to chorioamnonitis every infection to the mother may not reach the baby before still birth and still birth because of maternal infection can be because of many reasons high fever respiratory dysfunction and all but chorioamnonitis specifically because a bacteria virus are entering the placenta syphilis again the placenta is blocked listeria there are micro abscesses so it causes either placental dysfunction or placental uh, iugr which which will uh, uh, end with iugr it is chorioamnonitis just a word means infection of the chorion and amnion the cause of death will depend on the type of organism which is causing and pathology will depend on whether it is syphilis which is causing chorioamnonitis or it is toxo or it is listeria or it is strepto enterostreptococci it 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 will depend on the pathology of the causative bacteria thank you thank you thank you so much yeah we can go ahead with the third question ma'am this question will be for the participants okay okay so we'll have participant question first and uh, uh, very quickly you have to answer we will give you just one minute should i read or it's okay uh, well uh, ma'am you can read also a it young like... woman delivered a baby with limb hypoplasia and psychiatric skin lesions which died 2 hours after birth which of the following infections did the mother most likely have during her pregnancy choices are rubella cytomegalovirus chickenpox and toxoplasmosis So here the somebody answer is in the chat box. Uh, somebody has written an answer in the chat box, Rehana. Yes, Dr. Atiya Raza. Yeah. Answer is C. Yes, it's correct. So big hand for Dr. Atiya. Yeah. So uh, one to third question. Yes, ma'am. so this question is for the responders uh, what are the updates on predictors of intra uterine infections which one you will prefer and why 
Dr. Preeti's hand is up. Yes, Dr. Preeti. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for this opportunity. But so, we request you all to please uh, uh, stop raising your hands once you uh, once you come in. Uh, so, okay, Dr. Alok, please lower your hand, and Dr. Preeti can also lower the hand. Ji, ma'am. Done that. Ma'am, so uh, talking about the predictors of intrauterine infections, as we have discussed so far, there's not one infection that we are talking about. And so there can never be just one predictor that we can pick and choose. So there will be multiple factors that we can find in the mother and the baby that will predict the infections in the cases of a pregnant woman. When we talk about the mother, we may have a fever in the mother. She may be tachycardiac. She may have uh, her labs may be deranged, she may be having a high TLC, she may have a high CRP. When we do cultures, we may find a positive blood culture. Sometimes if the infection is very severe, serum lactate levels may also be deranged. Sometimes inflammatory markers like interleukins, IL-6, IL-8, TNF-alpha, they may also be elevated. Another method would be to do an amniotic fluid gram stain, which is a definitely a more invasive method. But yes, sometimes a gram staining of the amniotic fluid can also suggest an intrauterine infections. Other things that, of course, when we talk about amniotic fluid gram stain, that means that we are taking an invasive procedure. We are doing either an amniocentesis or some other method by which we are taking out the fluid from the amniotic sac. And when we are doing that, we can also test it for other features like fetal predictors, like fetal CRP, fetal WBCs. So amniocentesis is definitely helpful in diagnosis, but it is not done earlier in pregnancy. We generally do it only after 18 to 20 weeks of pregnancy. Otherwise, risk of fetal losses increase exponentially. So here my answer would be that if we are suspecting an intraamniotic infection in the mother, we have to have some element of fever, high temperatures, almost 39 degrees Celsius or higher, and something else clinically, some other additional clinical factors might be present associated with it, like raised TLC or raised CRP. And in the fetus, definitely the only method that we can rely on would be by an invasive testing like amniocentesis. Yeah, I think very well covered. Uh, this is what uh, it is. Rehana, would you like to add something? I yes, ma'am. Very well answers. explained, Dr. Priya. Yeah. Dr. Preeti has nicely explained. Very yes. really correct. Very correct. So, coming on to the uh, uh, fourth question: uh, Is congenital pneumonia due to fetal infection a reason for stillbirth? Okay, it's already read by Dr. Archana. Dr. Archana has raised the hand. Yes, Dr. Archana. Yes, sir. At the outset, I would like to thank Professor Poona, ma'am, Professor Tumkin, ma'am, Dr. Rehana for giving me this opportunity and making me a part of this webinar. Uh, now coming to the question, uh, congenital pneumonia by definition refers to uh, pneumonia which is established at birth or which appears within first week of life, preferably uh, usually between 24 to 48 uh, hours of life. Now the maternal colonization or infection with a variety of pathogens is the most important risk factor for neonatal infection, including congenital pneumonia. And uh, these, uh, the causes uh, has been very well explained earlier also by Dr. Amita Pandey and uh, Malini, uh, Dr. Malini Prashad, Madam. But just to enumerate, uh, it could be bacterial uh, pathogen like uh, 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 GBS or even Staphylococcus, Streptococcus, Enterococcus. It could be a spirochete like syphilis, uh, which usually causes pneumonia alba with bilateral opacities of the lung. Then it could be a cytomegalovirus, toxoplasma. And the route of infection, of course, uh, can be a transplacental spread, or it could be a sending route from the vagina, or it could be due to aspiration of the infected amniotic fluid as well. And uh, then uh, uh, coming to the uh, second part of the question, how it can be prevented, uh, then I would say the strategies to prevent congenital pneumonia should focus on appropriate management of uh, the maternal infection or exposures, uh, which result in increased uh, risk of infection to the neonate. So uh, uh, that would include uh, uh, the preventive strategies, uh, the, uh, like uh, we have to educate the patient about maintaining the hand hygiene, hand washing, and uh, doing, during antenatal period, the universe, uh, the uh, STD screening and treatment, 
uh, then of course uh, nutritional supplements and then uh, as dr amita pandey was talking of uh, educating the mother about avoiding contact with the pets avoiding travel and all those things but uh, one very important uh, uh, thing is that uh, prevention of the early onset gbs will definitely decrease the incidence of uh, uh, congenital gbs associated pneumonia absolutely and um, for this uh, cdc uh, says uh, that universal uh, culture based screening should be done at 35 to 37 weeks but uh, rcog guideline uh, uh, does not recommend uh, the universal screening but there are certain risk factors like preterm labor when women has pre um, labor rupture of membrane for more than 18 hours when women is having pyrexia or when gbs um, comes positive in urine or uh, swab or if the mother most importantly if the mother gives history of previous uh, gbs affected babies uh, then in these cases it is very important to give intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis and of course the drug of choice is um, uh, uh, penicillin benzyl penicillin uh, which is given in the dose of 3 g as a loading dose then 1.5 g uh, every 3 to 4 hours if women is uh, allergic to penicillin we can uh, switch to cephalosporin like cefuroxim um, and uh, nowadays uh, there are vaccines uh, which are uh, undergoing phase 2 trial uh, uh, vaccine which will uh, promote uh, anti gbs immunoglobulin in the mother and trans placental transfer to the baby and uh, of course um, the vaccination of mother uh, by influenza uh, against influenza and pertussis is already uh, been recommended uh, in india as well thank you so much dr achna indeed it was a very nicely uh, you know structured uh, answer so uh, dr ayana anything for you to add and dr sarla would like to add something Um, very very nicely she has explained the prevention and the management the risk factors i think if sarla ma'am wants to add anything nothing from my side i think i i as i understood the question was is congenital can congenital pneumonia be a cause of stillbirth answer simple answer is yes the rationale or the pathogenesis is when the fetal infection occurs through placenta fetal infection can occur two ways one through the mother's blood going to the placenta going to the villi going to the umbilical vein and from umbilical vein it will go straight to the liver and then other organs but when infection occurs from placenta to membranes and from that into the amniotic fluid and when the fetus aspirates that am amniotic fluid the pneumonitis occurs now if this pneumonitis occurs many a times there is a fetal inflammatory response or at the same times there is rupture of membrane the preterm labor starts and fetus may be born with congenital pneumonia and it may be live if the fetus does not deliver or the labor doesn't set in that pneumonia inside the uterus will cause stillbirth so the pathogenesis is if pneumonia persist in the intra uterine life cause is infection of the amniotic fluid through membranes into the amniotic fluid stillbirth will occur the etiology can be rupture of membrane with so many organism or ascending infection can occur without okay. rupture of membranes also okay. and without rupture of membrane is the tragedy where we do not know that infection is there and mother is having it there also fetus can die because of ascending infection through that corioidal infection pneumonia and stillbirth if pneumonia baby lives in intrauterine life for a few more days or hours thank you ma'am thank you so much thank you ma'am dr riana will we have Was uh, I mean for the participants, or should we move on to? Yes. Yeah. So we have the quiz, and uh, which one of the following perinatal infection has the highest risk of fetal infection in the first trimester? Hepatitis B virus, syphilis, toxoplasmosis, or rubella? Uh, Nitika has answered first, and then Doctor yeah. Atiya. Answer is D. 
Now, Dr. Atiya has the correct answer. Yeah. Great. What are the global study findings of COVID infection and stillbirth? Dr. Sorry, Shabana. Dr. Shabana. Uh, you are the first one. So many global studies uh, already have done in India as well as uh, in other countries also in wave one and two and three. And the conclusion of these studies are like this, that uh, in the first wave of COVID era, uh, there were uh, lots of many comorbidities associated, associated with the mothers. And But there was uh, this thing, there was a fear for going to the hospitals for delivery, for the antenatal checkups. And that's why this add on the bad uh, perinatal outcome. So the rates was uh, uh, more like a stillborn. Shabana, you've got muted. Placental, yeah, yeah. No, ma'am, some uh, call was there. Okay. So in the wave one, only the patient, they were uh, they were so fearful to go to the hospital. That is the one point noted in the studies. So uh, another thing is because of some lockdown issues. In the Delta variant, the second wave when it came, Delta variant, it uh, uh, produces lots of many effect on the mother as well as the fetus. It was very lethal and uh, the studies are showing placental changes in the histology like hypoperfusion, inflammatory changes, fibrin deposition, all these things. So the rate, when we compare wave one and wave two, the rate of stillborn was significantly high in the Delta variant and also in the Alpha variant in uh, SARS-CoV-2 wave two time. Uh, in this third wave, uh, it was very viral and so many population are vaccinated also. So no studies are showing anything uh, like rates are increasing for stillborn and all. Uh, that's the thing I analyzed by studying various uh, research of COVID-19. Yeah, I mean, uh, if we really look into it, uh, there have been several studies. There have been very recent study of 2020 also. Uh, there are some places where they have said that stillbirth for more. There are some places where they are saying that stillbirths were not so many uh, and there was no change as far as, uh, uh, you know, the uh, data is concerned. Uh, but uh, uh, there definitely there are certain reasons where because of which probably these deaths have been there and many of them were in the first wave that uh, women were not coming there was so much of uh, issue about seeing the women at right time a uh, number of women you know they had major congenital anomalies uh, when they were detected uh, uh, at 28 weeks and all uh, but we couldn't do anything so rihana i would like you to you know talk a little bit more what uh, uh, you have prepared this uh, first wave, second wave, third wave. So just uh, very quickly, can you please talk about this? Ma'am, in the first wave, as it's already being said that people had a, uh, too much of anxiety and fear in going to the hospitals and uh, that is uh, that was one of the most important reason for increased stillbirth rate. Otherwise, as such, it was seen that with the beta variant, it was not a significant, it, it does not have has any significant effect on the pregnancy as such and especially in terms of the incidence of stillbirth directly but indirectly due, uh, it's very obvious that uh, the circumstances led to the high uh, rate of stillbirths with the second wave the most predominant uh, variant was the delta one and it led to uh, uh, increased stillbirth rates at some places, even SARS-CoV-2 alpha variant was also responsible. It leads to placentitis and severe placental destruction. That led to placental um, malfunction and insufficiency. And that is why at that time, in fact, all of us might have noticed that a sudden IUD, we have also found many patients who landed up into, everything was fine when the patient uh, came with high-grade fever, Mother was having all the symptoms and suddenly the fetal demise occurs. And with the third uh, wave where the Omicron variant was there, the impact uh, was low. Maybe at, at this time, uh, maternal vaccination has also started. Maybe that was one of the reason and that uh, led to protection. Uh, that was the reason. So. Also the outcome that 
depends on the when the mother is suffering from other comorbidities yeah especially comorbid conditions they had a bad so impact on the yeah. three time the three uh, waves comorbid conditions had their share in all the three ones but if mother is fine it was fine that the delta variant was the one in which the outcome was poor and it was the placental inflammation which led to uh, ischemia and uh, insufficient a pregnant lady had no complaints but mild cervical uh, uh, lymphadenopathy in the first trimester she was prescribed spiramycin but she was non compliant she delivered a stillborn baby with hydrocephalus and intracerebral calcification and cataract which of these is uh, the most likely cause toxoplasmosis cmv cryptococcus or rubella i think sinu ne bhi wahi kiya hai k a this is kashish ayas and then we have himali sena all the three are correct but atiya raza we clap for her again she is correct we should clap for all the participants yes quickly what is an oracle trial and which antibiotic has been recommended in it as a drug of choice dr anuja please uh well uh, or uh, we all know that one of the postulations for preterm labor or preterm delivery is infection and so oracle trial was done uh, as to use of antibiotic in prevention of prom and preterm labor and to see the neonatal outcome the drugs that were used or uh, in the oracle trial were uh, erythromycin or amoxicillin clavulanic acid and that's the disadvantage of this oracle trial that only these two uh, drugs were tested and the conclusion of this oracle trial was that yes these drugs when were we used have uh, given rise to increase in the uh, or improved the uh, the perinatal morbid uh, mor uh, perinatal outcome in patients with either prom or with preterm labor thank you so much anuja that was actually the gist of it and uh, Uh, we we really wanted to uh, tell all of you that uh, these were the two trials oracle 1 and 2 and uh, uh, you see when you are use, uh, doing a trial we have to also remember that we use it for the uh, for different setting it is not only meant for the medical colleges it is also meant for district hospital as well as chc phc so the drugs what we use as dr nuja rightly said was erythromycin which is commonly available and o amoxiclav uh, which is also uh, available we do talk and it about was really yes yes anuja yes yeah, and it was really a large trial where about 4867 uh, patients were subjected to this trial and the outcome was uh, really good with the use of these antibiotics thank you so much uh, rehana okay. any addition you want no ma'am yes she, she is correct Uh, these uh, this were the study and it was a very good trial but i just uh, wonder ki why when we are giving erythromycin to pprom patients then the outcome is good but if the patient is not having pprom their long term study says that those baby they develop cerebral palsy type kind of things i don't know maybe the babies were preterm maybe uh, could be like that yeah i mean uh, they they did evaluate uh, these two studies and there were not any uh, uh, you know comments and suggestions to improve these two studies uh, but yet uh, uh, everyone came to the consensus that if it is a term baby or preterm baby you can think about it but erythromycin should be a drug of choice because it is safe and it is easily available and does not cause any major issues on the uh the babies yeah so next please next question can a pregnant woman with premature rupture of membranes with closed cervical loss who has conceived after 10 years of infertility with ivf be given conservative management at 30 weeks of gestation dr alok would you like to answer um uh, ma'am the now now it's a tricky question uh, everything is at rest ma'am uh, the baby was ivf and uh, uh, mother family father and including doctor are in a hot soup because now she is in a pprom but yes the 
गुड न्यूज इज की इट द बेबी और मदर आर नियर अबाउट थर्टी टू so now we have to manage and surveillance has to be uh, quite a high level of surveillance should be there so in that management uh, in surveillance we have to do maternal and fetal both and has to be simultaneously it is not only surveillance Surveillance. but surveillance and management both are to be done simultaneously so i will enumerate that in maternal uh, surveillance we have to admit the patient we have to monitor the patient including vitals and uh, temperature Uh, specifically and temperature charting that is again four to six hourly and uh, we have to look for per so abdomen examination so that uh, tenderness uh, has to be ruled out or any features of chorio amnionitis have to be ruled out because if they are there then we have to terminate yeah. the pregnancy so again we have to look for all these things uh, a sterile valve valve pad has to be given to the patient to look for any leakage any pus discharge or any foul smelling leakage so we have to look for that uh we have to go for bi weekly tlc crp uh, maternal uh, and then uh, go for routine microscopy of urine and culture sensitivity of so urine that is bi weekly high vaginal swabs weekly high, high vaginal swabs has to be done so these all okay. things are to be done for maternal and mind uh, that we don't have to do pv examination because it decreases the latency and only ps examination is recommended in fetal uh, uh, surveillance we can go for uh, daily fetal movement count nst could be done 2 uh, to 3 uh, weekly growth scans including amniotic fluid index and pockets we are to be seen by physical profiles has to be seen uh, like uh, on ctg then uh, if we see to the uh, scenario of ppp prom uh, it has got 3% uh, including all the pregnancies and uh, that uh, what what it causes it causes perineal morbidity neonatal sepsis umbilical cord prolapse placental abrasion and again it is leading to a fetal death so uh, doing these all surveillance and things we are looking that the patient is not going into uh, this thing chorio amnionitis and if the like uh, again it all if we are going towards expectant management then we have to look upon whether uh, like, uh, what is the pog of the uh patient now this pog the, the patient in question uh, is having pog of 30 week pregnancy so we 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 have to add like we have to add antibiotics uh, the previous question were uh, so very well like we can add erythromycin we can add co amoxiclav we can add so antibiotics they prolong latency latent period for the delivery we can we have to add corticosteroids because we have to take the patient beyond 32 to 34 weeks so cortic steroids it causes again pulm- uh, these are fetal therapy uh, like uh, we are doing fetal therapy uh, through mother so uh, again pulmonary protection by uh, cortic steroids which are going to uh, protect uh, the fetus uh, like uh, against rds or uh, intraventricular hemorrhage or necrotizing enterocolitis then again we have to go for uh, neuro protection of the fetus that is uh, magnesium sulfate has to be added a short term tocolysis for the shifting of the patient for the shifting of the uh, fetus in utero to the higher center so short term tocolysis has to be added uh, into the uh, treatment and when you are seeing that everything is going everything is favorable to the fetus then only we are going to take the pregnancy to 37 weeks otherwise we can deliver around 34 weeks if the conditions are not favorable or if chorio amnionitis is setting in then we have to terminate the pregnancy so this is all we are going to manage yeah, and I mind think very very conclusive and uh, magnesium sulfate for neuro protection has a very important role to play uh, yes, in ma'am. this particular scenario uh we go on to next question uh, uh, rehana yes ma'am for the participants which of the following statement is mm-hmm. false regarding stillbirth mm-hmm. spontaneous preterm delivery is common when an infection is the cause of stillbirth infection is unlikely the cause of stillbirth unless it results in significant autopsy or placental findings the risk for stillbirth can be increased due to chlamydia infection that is diagnosed before or during pregnancy serological screening for toxoplasmosis chlamydia rubella or herpes is usually not suggested when these infections are not identified on placental or autopsy examination so 
this is the question let's see who has answered rehana there's an important patient very serious so i may have to leave yes, uh, uh, i'll request you to please conduct thank you everybody for being here indeed it is a good quiz going on so please carry on i'll try my best to join as early as possible yes sure ma'am so uh, dr kashish has answered uh, he is saying it is d dr somya is also saying it is d anyone else so the answer is uh, anyone else okay the answer is uh, c the risk for stillbirth can be increased due to chlamydia infection diagnosed before or during pregnancy so uh, anyhow uh, uh, we would like to clap for the participants for participating it's not it's, uh, you may not be always correct so um, very good and uh, we move on to the uh, next question no uh, okay okay i think somebody would debate regarding the part d yes ma'am it's uh, slightly this thing but uh, yeah, some some answer is c there. yeah yeah some ambiguity is there that's why i think they all answered d yeah that is why they answered it uh, yeah. like that but answer is this one so uh, moving on to next question are there any sonographic evidences of infection that lead, lead to stillbirth so uh, dr preeti wants to answer yes dr preeti thank you ma'am uh, yes i would like to take this question so when we talk about the ultrasonographic evidences of fetal infections as i said in the previous uh, question that i answered before because the infections are manifold their presentations will also be very varied since infections and their effect on the babies differ so much the ultrasound findings when doing an anomaly scan or even otherwise would be very varied and also the time at which the baby acquires the infection will lead to different changes if uh, acquire if the infection is acquired in the first trimester the presentation might be different from what we would see in the third trimester even then there are some certain common ultrasound findings when we talk about infections in the fetuses going on with the common infections toxoplasmosis it definitely we all know toxoplasmosis associated a lot of cases with uh, hydrocephalus microcephaly there's a lot of microophthalmia multiple systems are involved placental hepatic renal calcifications might be seen in cases uh, like uh, cmb we may have uh, again periventricular retinal hepatic calcifications may be seen placental calcifications may be seen hydrocephaly microcephaly cerebellar aplasia hydrops are very commonly seen in uh, cases of cmb infections if acquired later cmb may also lead to an iugr like condition uh, other infections like rubella rubella we all know leads to microcephaly micronathia cleft lip cleft palate encephalocele anencephaly rubella can also cause iugr in some cases cases like hsv we may again have calcification cerebral atrophy iugr if acquired later syphilis is something that can have very varied presentations depending on when in which part of the pregnancy the infection was acquired so placenta again we may have signs of inflammation iugr may be seen sometimes it is also associated with cardiac retinal intracranial placental hepatic calcifications sometimes there are bone deformities and sometimes even intrauterine fetal demise can occur we may just come across a stillbirth fetus when performing an ultrasound examination there are various other infections like for example varicella zoster we could have calcifications at various sites we could have uh, tuberculosis and listeriosis listeriosis could also lead to an intrauterine fetal device in very severe cases it could have several calcifications at several sites like intracranial calcifications and hydrops might be seen sometimes gonococcal infections are also associated with uh, calcifications in the especially intracranial calcifications or ophthalmologic calcifications a rarer examples would be some fungal infections that might go on to the fetus some malarial cases where the mother has a severe malaria and the infection goes on to the fetus they also might pre present with calcifications in the placenta they may, may present with a uh, growth restriction intrauterine fetal demises but those are rarer cases that we come across in our clinical practices 
Yes, think... Dr. Preeti, uh, very nicely you have explained the uh, ultrasound changes which we may get and as a preventive approach, uh, we can have uh, uh, anomaly scan or uh, NTNB scan, we can get that done. And uh, then the next question uh, which comes to us that the baby is having uh, this finding, say soft marker is present, how to proceed? I will not go into the detail because already we are running short of time. So uh, let's move on to the next question. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, we have two more questions, uh, Rihanna. Let's yes, ma'am, I'm moving quickly. fast. Because, yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah we'll do it very quickly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So can local infections cause stillbirth? Is it important to, to do recurrent per speculum examination to identify local infections early and treat them? That, uh, yes, Dr. Archana, please. Yes, uh, local infection uh, can cause stillbirth. Yes, uh, maybe in a large proportion of cases. And uh, uh, there are more than... Uh, many bacterial species which harbor in um, a vagina and they can ascend upwards to the cervix to cause intrauterine infection and that could be E. coli, group B, streptococcus, bacterial vaginosis uh, and sometimes chlamydia as well. And uh, regarding the second part, is it important to do recurrent per speculum examination? The answer is no, because it would rather increase the risk of infection. Yes, uh, very correct, Dr. Archana. So, uh, yeah. uh, without uh, taking much Last time, I move on to next question. Whether acute or chronic uh, infection cause uh, uh, stillbirths? If yes, how? And which chronic infections can cause stillbirths? Already discussed, there are so many infections in the ascending form, or it may be directly chronic illness. So, the infection are taking like this, it is directly attacking the fetus or it is attacking through the placenta by hypoperfusion or through the chronic illness of the mother, then ultimately deteriorating the fetal condition. Or sometimes there are some infection like HIV in which it is not directly passing the placenta, but the maternal condition is so much deteriorated when the CD4 count is less that ultimately stillborn can occur. But major infections in which we say the chronic infection are syphilis, malaria, and viral parvovirus, which is causing fetal anemia, fetal hydropes. These are all the infections which are, uh, and Lyme disease, listeria also in bacteria. Yes. Uh, Dr. Uh, very correct, Dr. Shabana. Untreated infection, they may cause stillbirth either by direct fetal involvement by placental damage or severe maternal illness. So there are many mm -hmm. chronic infections like syphilis, which leads to placental infection, decreasing the blood flow to the fetus and may lead to direct fetal infection also. And uh, the other one is the group B streptococcus. It can be transmitted by direct, uh, even with the intact membranes uh, and uh, or with ruptured membranes also. Uh, there is active colonization of the bacteria into the amniotic fluid and the fetus aspirates this leading to pneumonitis and uh, severe uh, fetal illness uh, occurs leading to stillbirth. Then the uh, other one is the parvovirus which crosses the placenta and preferentially attacks the erythropoietic system leading to, uh, lead, leads to fetal anemia, non-immune hydrops and fetal death. So um, th uh, there are varied mechanisms and the chronic infections, they lead to fetal stillbirths also. So moving on to the next question for the participants. Uh, a 25 year old primary gravida with 20 weeks of pregnancy has the first episode of asymptomatic bacteriuria. The risk of having pyelonephritis is, number one, no risk with the first episode, 5% of risk, 15% and 25%. So let's see how many participants have answered. Answer is D, 25%. <laughs> so we clap for all the participants. And with this, thank you. Thank you all the responders. Thank you, Poonam ma'am. And um, I really want to thank uh, Dr. Sarla ma'am also. Puna ma'am has uh, joined back. 
Yes, yeah. Thank you, everybody. And uh, we really thank all the responders. Some of them are at the airport. Some of them are <laughs> at their clinics. So everybody has joined and everybody has answered so well. And Rihanna, a special thanks to you because the way you prepared everything is really exemplary. Thank and you, uh, now we would uh, uh, like to, uh, uh, you know, uh, ask Dr. Tamkeen Khan uh, to say special thanks, especially to Sarla Madam for being here. And we can um, have her final comments as well. Yeah, Dr. Sarla and Dr. Anuradha Khanna is also there. I would request oh, okay. her also. Oh, we can have yeah. Thank you, thank you. It Hello, was a wonderful webinar. I really enjoyed. And uh, one thing I would like to say, all of the webinar, I have not uh, heard of bacterial vaginosis and role of probiotic. So anyone comment can do anyone, Tamkin? Role of bacterial vaginosis? It's still, you know, uh, earlier we had a lot of, you know, papers on that. Yeah. But at, currently, if you see, they are mm -hmm. still questioning whether it is really causing stillbirths or not. And even not they are questioning its role in preterm labor. Now they are not even yeah. questioning its role yeah. even in preterm labor right now. Yeah. And that comes the role of probiotic. Because everyone is writing right and left, especially the ART persons about the probiotic, so preventing this uh, uh, this bacterial vaginosis. So that comes in my mind while attending this very nice webinar on stillbirth. So, yeah, so lots of food for thought, uh, Dr. Anuradha. So yeah. we'll Hello? have the final concluding Hello? remarks by Dr. Salla, and we are really honored to have you, ma'am, Dr. Salla. Hello, ma'am. Some key, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. Hello, Dr. Alok. Madam, yeah. This is Dr. Alok here. Yeah, yeah. Like, like I, I want you to, I think, more publi publicize this, uh, uh, the stillbirth association or stillbirth society, because most of the people, like I was not knowing till I had a talk with Madam Poonam, so she was to like uh, mentor to me, and she always involves me in uh, her activities. So as soon as I heard that there is a society uh, also going on in India that uh, under. Uh, still birth society is there and Tamkeen Khan ma'am is uh, running the society. So kindly ma'am, advertise the same to most of the groups, please ma'am, and send us forms okay. so that we can also... Okay, thank you so the... much. We'll do that. Yes ma'am, yeah. so that we can also become the members. Yes, all of you are welcome on board, yeah. <laughs> Actually, so when I started, the the I had no idea that people are so passionate about it. When you talk um, to somebody, then only you come to know that everybody, you know, have has this... Uh, you know, at the back of their mind, they want to do something about stillbirths. But uh, it is only that when we come together, we understand each other's, you know, uh, what they are thinking of and how they want to, you know, uh, what they want to do about it. So thank you very much. That's really encouraging. So Dr. Sarla. Thank you very much, Dr. Tamkeen and Dr. Poonam for uh, asking me to chair this session. And it was my pleasure to be associated with this society for this cause. I think when I read the subject, it said stillbirth, infection-related stillbirth. This was a very, very specific topic. And it was very nice that you focused on this cause of stillbirth because stillbirths are multifactorial. We have so many causes of stillbirth and so many causes, but infection plays a very important role for stillbirth, especially in developing country like ours and many developing countries like ours, like South Africa and Sub-Saharan countries. Why infection is an important cause? Because as such, the stillbirths are very high in our country, five to 10 times higher than developed world. Secondly, infections are high in our country. Even treatable infections are high. So because of both reasons, the, the number which attribute to fetal death or stillbirths will be very high. And if we can do something to prevent this infection, it will be a great service of the society to people who lose their babies. And it's a very sad moment for any mother or any family, and even for the attending doctor to receive a stillborn baby. The first question comes to the mind, doctor, why my baby died? We are many a times able to answer. Sometimes we are unable to answer. 
And when we are unable to answer, the next question lurks in their mind. Will my future be affected like this? So it is very, very important to know the cause. And infection, since we took infection today, infection plays a very important cause for the stillbirth. And if we divide the stillbirth, it is early stillbirth, then late stillbirth, and then term and post-term stillbirth. In countries which take early stillbirth from 20 to 27 weeks, infection is the most important cause of stillbirth. Most important cause of stillbirth. In our country, maternal infection are the cause of stillbirth. How maternal infection cause stillbirth? They may not transmit the infection to the fetus. They cause stillbirth because of high fever, because of toxemia, because of their respiratory dysfunction, because of severe sepsis. So they cause stillbirth. And we still have mothers having hepatitis, dying with encephalopathy. We still have mothers dying of falciparum malaria. So one is maternal cause. Then fetal causes, which cause stillbirth because of infection. If we take studies which include early stillbirth, that is 20 to 27 weeks, plus 20 or eight weeks to 37 weeks, then infection where studies have been done has shown to be as high as 50% to be the cause of stillbirth. If it is so, then what are these infections? One is maternal, I have said. One is infection which occurs after rupture of membranes. Second is infection which occurs without rupture of membrane. When infection occurs after rupture of membrane, we have so many strategies. We have so many studies which tell us what to give, when to give, how long to give, when to deliver the baby, so as to avoid stillbirth. But it is very elusive for those stillbirth which occur because of infection where membranes are not ruptured. So that is a group which developing countries are very worried about it. And they are not so worried about for their own country because there the infection rate is low. But for developing country where this infection is high, so more studies are from those countries to give us infection with unruptured membrane, infection with descending, in, uh, ascending infection. So how these ascending infection cause stillbirth to the baby? One is by affecting the placenta or by affecting the fetus directly, like hepatitis virus, especially we had big spurt of maternal death and fetal death occurring with hepatitis once a time came in PGI, then mother's blood going directly to the fetus through placenta and entering the fetus liver and causing fetal in, uh, liver involvement and then heart and other uh, organs. So we have to prevent these ascending infections in very preterm babies. And we have to prevent infections where membranes have already ruptured. And then viral infections, we can't do much about it. Only is vaccination, that we see to it that vaccinate whatever vaccinations are available. Mothers are vaccinated before they become pregnant. And that's why prenatal screening uh, a pre-pregnancy screening, rubella is a very good thing to screen. When some couple comes to you, the doctor, we want to get pregnant. Any, any test you will, please add rubella that at least we know that she is immune to rubella. If she is not immune to rubella, then give her a dose of rubella and then let her get pregnant after three months of rubella vaccination. So vaccination is very important. Third is to know, to prevent these viral infection is, uh, to see that minimal uh, uh, symptoms which are there because of viral infection like low-grade fever or not feeling very well, think some skin lions, uh, sometimes they are cytomegalic virus, have skin lions on the mother. Think of that has mother got this infection, test at that time. If it doesn't happen at that time and stillbirth has occurred, then to know the cause of stillbirth, look for those in the fetus. 
whether it is in the form of the autopsy, placental autopsy, blood culture, and blood culture should be taken not from the surface of the membranes, deep inside, so that your culture, which report comes, should not be contaminant from the vagina. It should be from within the. Thirdly, we should take culture from the heart of the blood, heart of the fetus, so that culture is representative. We should not take superficial culture from the ears or skin, which get contaminated. So we, we, we should avoid this infection first, and then mother's nutrition need to be improved so that she becomes less prone to infection. And if she gets infection, we should be able to diagnose it and we should be able to prevent it before we can prevent more stillbirths because of the infection. So uh, if anybody wants to ask anything else, otherwise I think a very preventable cause and we should try to prevent it by all means possible, which have been enumerated. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank, you. You, so much. Thank you so much. So uh, Dr. Aisha, please, can you propose a vote of thanks? Uh, thank you so much, Tamkeen ma'am. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor to be presenting the vote of thanks for today's uh, webinar. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Professor Poonam and Professor Rehana ma'am for the meticulous planning and execution of the webinar. Uh, thank you, Professor Sarla, for uh, gracing the occasion with your presence and your comments for serving as chair for the webinar. Thank you very much, ma'am. I would also like to thank Dr. Malini. She's not here, she's left, uh, but I would like to thank her. And I would like to thank Professor Amita for their uh, wonderful presentations. And most um, importantly, I would like to thank the organizers for the very interesting quiz and all the responders and participants for the enthusiastic response. And I would like to thank Professor Neelam, Dr. Nuzhat, Dr. Tamkeen and Dr. Asna for their constant support always. Thank you so much everyone for joining us today.